This insider world is not our home. Unlike the world, we should honor our marriages. Be free from the love and money and material possessions. No longer living lives filled with human desires, but for God's, living pure lives. Therefore, we must leave the camp of this world and join Christ in the wilderness. Leave the darkness of our past behind us and take our place outside the camp with Jesus. For he alone can make us new. church family, turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. If you do not have a Bible, there is one in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you. Make it your own. You can keep it. Uh, You need a copy of God's Word. All right, so two weeks ago, we began a series called Outsiders. And uh, two weeks ago, I kind of laid the exegetical work of, of what is taking place uh, in this passage where, where we are called to come to Jesus outside the camp. And in, in that setting, so if you weren't here, I'm going to give you that quick refresher and reminder. I'm going to give you a, a two-minute recap so that we can set the stage for where we are this morning. Um, Jesus was crucified outside the camp, outside the city walls. He became a curse for us. He, He was unclean. He became unclean so that we could be clean. And using that imagery, the author of Hebrews begins to charge the people of God, right? He is closing his letter and he's charging the people. After all that he has said now, Now listen, beloved, come to Jesus. Let us go to him outside the camp. Now what does that mean? Number one, it means bearing his reproach and shame, right? Jesus was shamed. We are going to have to count the cost up front that you cannot live for the approval of man, okay, and follow Jesus. So what the Bible calls the natural world and the flesh hates Jesus, In fact, it crucified him, okay? And as we go out to him, there will be shame associated with it. So count that cost up front. But secondly, to go to him outside the camp also means that that we will walk the opposite direction, swim upstream from culture. Because this world is not your home, Okay? You have different values and priorities. You belong to the kingdom of God. And in fact, you're just ambassadors living in a foreign land. You are not home. But most importantly, we must remember that this is a call to him. Okay? To him. Because to know him is eternal life. And if you miss the call to him, and instead you just hear uh, that that this is going to be hard, that you're going to walk opposite direction, you will miss the gospel, and you will only hear God's commands, and you will try and do that in your own strength, and you will be defeated, all right? So always this call is to be filled with the Spirit of God, and as He empowers you and enables you to walk out to Him, He is always the end goal. All right, so now with that recap, we are ready for some direct application. So today's sermon is going to be direct application. Last week we looked at how earlier in Hebrews 13, we are charged as the people of God to have to to hold marriage in high honor. And this week, look with me at verse five, okay, where the author tells us, listen as I read, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. So that we may confidently say, 
The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, it is with great trust and faith that we say to you, Holy Spirit, examine our hearts. Search us. See if there is any wicked way within us. Father, would you convict with clarity whether our character is free from the love of money? Father, we know that if it comes from you, it is for our good, and you will heal us, and you will allow us to walk out. So, Father, with open hands, we say, please, have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Money! Come to me now! I think if you need to sow a seed right now, this anointing is present. I'm going to ask you to sow a $214 new season seed. I am speaking prophetically by the Holy Spirit, and you are to sow a $3,000 seed. Somebody's son is going to be set free from alcohol because of your thousand dollar seed. You're gonna get your harvest, you have to get in the now zone. And if you're gonna get this money, you gotta get in the now zone. I'm talking about now prosperity. I'm talking about now deliverance. I'm talking about now money. I'm talking about now promotion. I'm talking about now. Now is the time. Money coming now. He needs you well, and he needs you strong, and he needs you rich. Jesus is the banker. Let's receive our evening offering this evening. Give you a chance to raise your income. The prosperity gospel is wicked. And it is deceptive because it tries to teach you that you can love money and love God at the exact same time. That they are not mutually exclusive that God wants you to love money. That the more you love God, the more that he will give to you riches and promotions and health and prosperity. Amen. Beloved, this is wicked and evil because it directly contradicts Jesus' teachings and his warnings, okay? His warnings of the Bible. Listen to Jesus. No one can serve two masters, for you will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Listen to this. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Now, I want you to notice that says the love of money. This entire sermon is going to be about the heart issue, right? The love of money. Not necessarily having money, but the love of money is where the scripture takes aim. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness. Ecclesiastes 5.10, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And again here in our text, Hebrews 13, verse 5, make sure that your character is Free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. You see, the prosperity gospel deceives because it says to your heart that you can supremely pursue the motivation of riches and jobs and promotion. Treasure those things in your heart and Jesus will give you those things. But this makes 
God the means to get stuff, right? The true end of your heart and your longing is the stuff. God is the end of salvation, not stuff. To know him is eternal life. Guys, Jesus saved you to give you himself, to give you himself. He is the gift, not so that you could worship stuff. He is jealous for your affection. Think about how ridiculous that statement is. Okay, the sovereign king, God of the entire universe, is personally jealous for your affection, okay? Do not be deceived. To love money is to first love yourself and not God. Let me ask it this way. What is your biggest problem? Because how you answer that question, it frames everything. Because the Bible says that our, each of us individually, our biggest problem is sin. It is a deceitful heart that wanders from God. Do you believe that God sent his son, that he gave his son for you? You see, if our biggest problem was the economy, then you would say, God, send us an economist. If our biggest problem was leadership and government, you would say, oh God, send us politicians. If our biggest problem was our health, you would say, oh God, send us a physician. But God sent his son, the savior of the world, to overcome sin. Because our greatest need is our sinful heart that exchanges the love of God for our own desires. And so that's where we should start. We should beg the Holy Spirit. Our biggest fear should should be being deceived into our own desires. And we should beg the Holy Spirit, search me. Do not not let me be deceived. That that is to be blind. That is to treasure things that are not real. Search me. And to let Jesus' words pierce your soul. You cannot love God and money. And here, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Now, beloved, the rest of the sermon, you're going to notice a a shift in tone, okay? From warning to how can we now discern, okay? How can I know if my heart loves money more than God? So listen to Jesus' words. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, what's amazing about the Bible, okay, is that it, it doesn't ignore the deepest longings of your heart. The deepest questions, of, it doesn't ignore those, okay? The Bible doesn't say, don't try and be great. Rather, it says, the greatest in the kingdom are servants. And notice here, it doesn't say, don't desire treasure, all right? So if when you hear the command, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, if you hear that as don't desire that which is valuable and precious, then you're hearing wrong. And that's really good news because 
If that were the case, the the Christian life would only be about suppression. But that's not what it says. In fact, it says the exact opposite. Jesus actually commands us to pursue that which is valuable and precious. He commands it. Verse 20, store up for yourself treasure. Do this. But his investment advice is all about location. In heaven. Don't store up treasure here. It doesn't last. In fact, it will not last. It rusts. It gets lost. It gets ruined. I mean, how many times have you or your spouse, you you bought a brand new outfit, you wore it one time, you go to hang it up, and it's got either a hole or a stain in it. And you're like, this is why we can't have good stuff. (laughs) Or... Think with me about the Christmas season, right? Especially as as a parent, particularly when your kids are little. And like, there is a new toy that is out and there is a mad rush to get your hands on that item, okay? The new hot toy of the season. And and you can always watch on, uh, on the news how like there's a mad rush at Walmart and they're trampling over each other, right? To get to, in 1996, it was, it was Tickle Me Elmo, okay? Right, it was Tickle Me Elbow and then it became Pokemon and then it was the Razor Scooter and recently it was like Frozen merchandise, right? So think about this, right? Because at the moment, those prized possessions, they are like it. Your heart covets them. Christmas will be ruined if we do not get a Tickle Me Elmo. Where are 99% of all Tickle Me Elbows now? (laughs) They're at the dump. So when Jesus commands us to not store up treasure here, is it because he says, because it might be lost? No, it's because it will be lost. It will be. You cannot take any of it with you. Randy Alcorn has an incredible illustration in in his book, The Treasure Principle, where he says, all right, imagine with me that you are a northerner living in the south at the end of the Civil War, and you know that the north will soon win and end the war. And so the question is, is what should you do with your Confederate money? What should you do with your Confederate money? Now, the obvious answer is you should only keep enough to get you by until, that, until they win the war. And with everything else, you should exchange it for U.S. currency, right? Because once the Confederacy goes away, its money is worthless, And the U.S. currency is the only thing left that has any value on the other side. Now, this just isn't a friendly tip. It is stupid to invest in what will lose all of its value. All right? That is dumb. Do not do that. In 1922... Uh, King Tutankhamun's uh, tomb was discovered uh, in Egypt. Now, this is is a rarity because uh, grave robbers hadn't been there first. So the Egyptians buried their pharaohs with tremendous wealth, okay, Uh, in, in hopes that they could take it on into the afterlife. Now, it had been 3,000 years since King Tutankhamun had been buried. Does anyone want to guess how much of his gold was still there? All of it, right? All of it. And we know this. We know this. So here's a genuine question for your heart. Do you believe that the treasures that God will reward us on the other side Do you believe that those treasures are beyond amazing? That they are worth 
every sacrifice of delayed gratification on this side. Right? When he says that he is going to give us eternal treasures, do you trust him? That the God who created and spoke this universe into being, that when he says he's going to reward you with, with, with treasures that are beyond your comprehension, do you genuinely believe that? Because here's the principle from Jesus. Your heart always goes to where your treasure is. Okay, so wherever you are spending God's money, all right, because it's all his, wherever you are spending God's money is where your heart is. So how do I know if my character is free from the love of money? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Follow the money. Do you spend your resources Chasing his kingdom, investing in eternal rewards, trusting that God in heaven will keep them? Or do you over-accumulate stuff here, right, where there's never enough, you always need one more, then the moment you get that one, your heart immediately jumps to the next thing and is preoccupied with that, the next. I got to have it. You see, to love money is to lack contentment. There is never enough. And then there's the increased anxiety of trying to hold on to it or protect it, even though you're going to leave it all behind. So ask yourself this morning, are you content? Because to love God first, he brings contentment. He satisfies your soul. He satisfies, but, but money never will. So where is your treasure? Now, there's another important issue that I need to address this morning because there is a common misconception when you read the Bible, and that is this. Is God anti-rich? Is he anti-prosperity? Does he only work through suffering and the poor? Should we feel guilty over our prosperity? Now, sometimes we press so hard against the prosperity gospel and what they get wrong, that that's a false gospel, that it leaves us confused and feeling like wealth is now a bad thing. So, let me be clear about this. Yes, the Bible warns, okay, about the dangers associated with being rich because it tempts our heart to love stuff, the wrong things, okay? So the Bible warns the rich about being callous towards those less fortunate. It warns the rich about being prideful and trusting in their wealth. It warns the rich against abusing power and influence because with money comes power and influence. And it warns the rich against overindulging in pleasures and comfort. But a fair assessment of the Bible also says that there are many rich, positive examples throughout the Bible. Abraham was wealthy. He was a wealthy, powerful man in his context. And so was Isaac and Jacob, okay? Blessed abundantly by God. Joseph rose to the number two in all of Egypt, which, by the way, was the superpower at the time. Job, he begins and ends massively rich. Boaz is the rich, righteous rescuer of Ruth, David and then Solomon were kings who represent the wealth of a nation. Daniel became prominent and wealthy in Babylon. In the New Testament, Joseph of Arimathea is the one who, he's a rich man who lends his tomb to Jesus. 
John Mark's family, as you come through the book of Acts, the, the, the early church would meet at John Mark's mother's house. She had a very large house and servants that went with it. Lydia in Philippi, okay, uh, was a very wealthy businesswoman. In fact, she probably became a benefactor to Paul and his missions. As you comb through Acts, you see in, in Berea and Thessalonica and Ephesus that many prominent wealthy people come to faith in Jesus. Barnabas, in Acts chapter 4, sells his land and lays it at the apostles' feet. In fact, let's pause right there for a second because it's very common for us to read the Bible and to say, you know Luke, the author of the gospel of Luke and Acts, he seems to be anti-rich. But if you actually take a closer look at what's going on uh, in Luke and Acts, the details actually reveal something entirely different. Luke himself was a physician, and he is writing, both letters are addressed to Theophilus, who is his wealthy benefactor, the one who is actually paid for the writing of this gospel. And so as you, see, as you go through Luke, you actually see that Luke is trying to teach the wealthy, the elite, how to follow Jesus with their money. And his work is full of pairings of one positive example, okay, of a rich person who follows Jesus, who gets it right, but right there beside a negative example of someone who uh, completely misses Jesus and misses the kingdom of God. So, for example, in Luke chapter 18, you have the rich young ruler right side by side with Zacchaeus. Okay? And the rich young ruler is an example of someone who loved money to the point where he missed the kingdom of God. But Zacchaeus is an example that immediately follows of someone who was rich and had been abusing people, but he repented and he repaid. He, he shows you how you can love God with your money. Another pairing is in Acts chapter 4, Barnabas, who uh, is wealthy enough to sell his property and lay the money down at the apostles' feet. He's generous. He's investing in the kingdom. But that example is followed by Ananias and Sapphira, who are deceitful in their sell of property. They withhold money, but they want to be known as generous as Barnabas, and so they pretend to be that way. But in fact, they're really just seeking the approval of man. They want to be seen as more generous than what they are. So be like the rich people who get what it means to follow Jesus, like the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, and not like the rich fool who later stores up endless treasure on earth but has no treasure with God. So in the end, guys, God is not anti-rich. Just like any good father, he loves to give good gifts to his children so that they can be enjoyed. But you know what else God loves? When his children become like him, servants like him, when they lay down their rights in order to bless others, whenever you realize that I have been blessed so that I can be a blessing. In fact, Jesus said that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Christians know that. And Christians lead their hearts into generosity over more self-indulgence. As Randy Alcorn stated, giving is the only antidote to materialism. So you ask again, how do I know if my character is free from the love of money? Well, how generous are you? How generous are you? First, I would say to the kingdom of God, okay? And by the way, this isn't just about money, although this sermon is about the love of money, okay? Because for some of you, the most important asset you have is your time. 
All right, so you have time, talent, and treasure. And so are you generous to the kingdom? And secondly, I would qualify and I would ask us, are you generous towards the poor, towards the less fortunate? Because the Bible warns us that we become callous. Riches make us callous towards people who are less fortunate. So are you generous towards the single mother, the fatherless child, the foreigner, and the widow? Now, hear me, I'm not saying that this calls for us to be generous without wisdom, right? Throw all, I'm not saying throw all wisdom out. So in our day and culture, if I say go be generous towards the poor, I don't think you should go take $100 cash and give it to the person on the street corner. I don't think that's wise. And even politically, what it means for us to be generous towards the foreigner doesn't mean that, uh, that we have to agree with complete open borders and anarchy, all right? That, that's not, you, you don't have to throw away wisdom. The question is, and I don't have time to search all the details of that, but I do want to ask you to honestly search your heart. What is your post- posture towards those who are less fortunate. Now, as a church, I certainly think that we, I mean, we try and practice what we preach. We try and be good stewards of God's resources. We try and invest in the kingdom, both locally and around the world. Last year, we as a church generously gave more than half a million dollars to missions Okay, that's, that's investing in the kingdom locally and globally. Many of our partners are among the poor and less fortunate. And we don't just give, right? We serve, we go, we have relationship, right? We love our mission partners. So I want you to know that, that we try and practice what we preach. Last year as a church, we generously responded when... Uh, Uh, catastrophe popped up, so the earthquake in Turkey or the fire in Hawaii or the the, the brutal attack in Israel, like like we gave as a church to those things. In fact, listen to this story. One of our church members wanted to to give anonymously um, to, to a water project in Uganda. And being very generous, we contact our, our partner, Celebrate Hope, and, and uh, they're, they're out in, in, in the poor community, but, but their city, they know of other villages, Celebrate Hope, that they go and they work with. And so we asked them, and, and they found the, the perfect spot, the perfect area that could use, a, uh, that could use uh, water. So here's a picture, all right, of of their water source before. It, it's a pond, it's, it's untreated, and it is miles away. So daily, the women and children would have to carry gallons of buckets on their head and walk for miles just to function through the day. Check this out. After eight kilometers of pipes, okay, from a well, now two villages and two schools and a health clinic now have clean, treated, running water. This serves more than 6,000 people, right? This area has been impacted forever by this water gift, all because a Christian generously invested in the kingdom of God. All right, so listen to this verse, because 1 Timothy 6 does a great job of summarizing what I've said this morning. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, right? Why? Because it doesn't last, okay? But instead, right, get and fix on God. Fix your heart on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. You see that there? Why does God give you goodness in your life? So that you can enjoy it. That's a good biblical thing for you to enjoy the blessings that God has given you. 
Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Storing up for yourself the treasure of a good foundation for the future, right? Store up your treasure in heaven so that they will take hold of that which is life indeed. Because that which is in heaven, that which is eternal, guys, it's there forever. Do you trust that God is good in what he has promised you, right? That's a good word right there. All right, so let's close by reading our text one more time. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we will confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Come to Jesus outside the camp. View your money opposite the world. You're just his manager. Enjoy what God has richly supplied to you. But do not love money. Love God. And invest in the eternal kingdom. And be generous, church. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love your word. Your word does not skirt any of the real issues of our heart, but you, you give us clarity, right? Father, you, you teach us to value, right, and to pursue. You command us to pursue that which is good and lasting and eternal. Father, we needed this word this morning because our hearts so easily get distracted. Yes, there is much in this world that glitters and shines. And it captivates our attention. Father, wisdom that is from you reminds us that it is so short and it only lasts. It will rust. It will fall apart. We will leave it behind. And so, Father, fix our heart on you that you are better that you satisfy, that in your right hand you have the, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. And Father, you bring contentment. And so Father, as we've asked you to search our hearts this morning, we know that if you've convicted, you heal. You encourage us forward. We want to walk with you in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, as our praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. However, the Spirit of God has pressed you this morning, okay? We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you came in with a burden, do not leave with that on your own. Allow us to, to carry that with you. We are a family. We're not here to play church. We're a family. So I pray that you would have the, uh, the, the courage to come and, and get prayer if you need it. If you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar to pour out your heart of gratitude before the Lord, please know that you have the freedom to do so. Church family, would you stand and be obedient to whatever God has said?